This is Morning Edition. I'm Bob Edwards. Software has become one of the most important technologies of the modern world, yet it's one of the least understood. It's not made of metal or silicone. It's created out of logic, instructions that give order and meaning to a computer's electrical circuitry. The word software usually calls to mind colorful boxes on the shelves at your local computer store. Most software, though, is hidden from view. It connects your telephone calls, starts your car, and keeps airplanes on course. NPR's Dan Charles has the first of three reports. There was a time when the workings of a clock represented physically our system of time. The swing of a pendulum ticked off the seconds, and a set of wheels and gears of different sizes translated that steady, predictable movement into the motion of hands that measured minutes and hours. In a digital watch today, that relationship, that logic in our system of time, is reduced to computer instructions, software. That's the simplest use of software. It's replaced complex and expensive machinery and makes watches cheaper. But software has its greatest impact in giving machines intelligence. They can react to changing conditions like the wishes of their owner. Take this example. Let's say it's 40 years ago. You're an enterprising inventor, and you're trying to rig up equipment to accomplish the following sequence of events. You're not home. Your clock, when it strikes nine o'clock, turns on a radio sitting on the kitchen table. When a girl marries, Maxwell House, that right, mellow, satisfying coffee that's good to the last drop, presents when a girl marries. A Simultaneously, a tape recorder starts up, recording this broadcast. An hour later, the radio dial spins a quarter turn to the right to another station. The Lone Ranger! The tape records this broadcast, too. Then both machines turn themselves off. Two hours of recorded radio awaits your return home. Now, 40 years ago, you may have been able to pull this off if you were a mechanical genius. Today, thanks to software, it happens routinely every time you program your VCR. Programming is exactly the right word. You are activating the machine's internal controls. It's software. Take another example, a far more complicated machine that constantly has to react to changing conditions, the modern automobile. It's a little bit rough here, actually, for the test I wanted to do. Joe Adams, an engineer with Chrysler, is driving down a road just outside Chelsea, Michigan. It's a private road owned by Chrysler, where the company's employees drive new cars around a racetrack over murderous bumps and down steep hills just to see how they work. What I'm doing here is I'm just on the gas here and I'm letting off the gas here all the way um, from about 50 miles an hour here. Adams wants to see what happens when his foot comes off the accelerator. Does the car just coast along smoothly or does the motor act like a brake and slow the car down? What I'm going to do now is I'll take a piece of data on that and then I'll change the engine control program to make that feel different. The engine control program is a computer program, and the computer that's running this software, the engine control unit, is mounted in a rugged steel box down beside the engine. There's one of these computers on any car you buy these days, but the one on this car is hooked up to a screen and a keyboard riding along on top of the dashboard. So while he's still driving along, Joe Adams can reach up, tap a few keys, and change one small piece of that engine control program. What he's changing is one number, a variable, he calls it, that helps determine how much fuel the motor gets. Now what I can do is I can go into that variable there and I'm going to change that and I'm going to take another bit of data here. Adams takes the car back up to 50 miles an hour and takes his foot off the throttle again. This time, inside the engine controller, a slightly different calculation takes place. This calculation involves thousands of variables, the speed of the engine, the temperature of the motor, but this time, one variable is different. So, I can feel that change that just took place there. The car slowed down more abruptly. It jerked us forward in our seats ever so slightly. That's not a good thing, Adam says. The first setting was better. Now, old-style mechanics had ways to do this as well. Their tools were the physical properties of metal and air. 
They hooked together gears, springs, and vacuum chambers to make sure when you gave the engine gas, it surged forward, and when you took your foot off the accelerator, it slowed down, but not too quickly. But that mechanical system basically just connected the gas pedal to a valve that let air into the motor. Joe Adams's software is like a contraption that connects everything in the motor to everything else. It connects them through logic. Thousands and thousands of if-then statements. If we're straining to get up a hill, then adjust the moment the spark plug fires. If the engine is hot, then change the mixture of fuel and air. If the weather is 90 degrees or 10 below zero, then make other changes. This all happens simultaneously, thousands of times each second. And you just never had that fine control with, with um, uh, mechanical systems where you'd kind of have to say, okay, let's make it, make it start and run at 20 and make it start and run at 70 and make sure that it at least starts at 100 degrees and kind of in between. You, don't, you, you can't check those points. Change that software and you change the car. Joe Adams says starting with cars made this year, you'll be able to get what amounts to a software upgrade for your car. Just go to a Chrysler dealer. He will dial up on his computer link. He'll get the software over the computer link, and then he will then flash that into your car without even taking the module out of the car. And you'll be on your way in 15 minutes with... Um, better fuel economy and uh, cleaner emissions if the change affected that or if it was just a, a drivability glitch that was fixed and you're on your way without the hassle and the stocking charges. It's just a lot of money that's been saved by having the computers smart enough to accept new input over their life. This is the apparent magic of software. It's like a set of cables and springs and valves of unimaginable complexity. Yet they never rust or leak or break. They operate at lightning speed and when you want to change them a bit, you don't need to manufacture new parts, you just rewrite a little bit of the program. David Fisher funds research on software at the government's National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's hard to find any product in the world today that has any degree of complexity that isn't mostly software. Look closely at the largest and most complex machine you can find, the telephone system, for instance, or a radar system built for the military, or an assembly line. At its heart, like a hidden choreographer, chances are you'll find software. The people who own these machines and factories turn to software to replace mechanical controls, as Chrysler's engineers did, but also to replace people. The first jobs it takes over are those where there's a predictable response to a predictable situation, an if-then statement. If a caller wants John Smith, then dial extension 247. At a checkout counter, if the can carries such and such a barcode pattern, then charge the customer $2.99. Corporate managers and government officials alike have come to depend on software. Increasingly, financial success and public safety depend on it. And that has raised worries among some people who are most intimately familiar with how software works. They say the larger and more complex the computer program, the more likely it is to contain hidden flaws and the harder it is to find them. This is Dan Charles reporting. This is Morning Edition. I'm Bob Edwards. Every year, computers leap forward in speed and power. A computer that once filled a room now fits neatly inside a briefcase. What often doesn't keep pace is software, the programs that are the brains of a computer. It's the software that turns a computer's electrical circuitry into a tool for solving problems. Many computer specialists think software is in a long-standing state of crisis. NPR's Dan Charles has the second of three reports. Edsker 